Um, first, I just want to start off, Tucker, how, how did you get into this? I mean, you know, how are you known as a seed oil expert? I mean, I imagine 20 years ago, this probably isn't something you, you would have imagined for yourself, but here we are. Yeah, that's an understatement. Um, <laughs> so I got into this very unwillingly um, in my late 30s. Well, you know, for a number of years, but it really climaxed in my late 30s, I had a number of health issues. And, you know, the medical system was able to do some treatment of the symptoms, but, you know, there was no discussion of root causes. Um, at the time, I was a software engineer and uh, technology expert on Wall Street. So I was very big in root cause analysis. And through some dumb luck, honestly, one day I started learning about this seed oils topic and decided to um, fix my own diet by cutting out seed oils, literally while standing in the salad bar <laughs> at, at work um, and just got to the end and looked at these little squeeze bottles of dressings. And I said, that has got to be the worst, crappiest oil known to man to get it into this cafeteria. And right then I decided to stop eating them and all of my health problems started rapidly in improving. So then I started getting interested in why this was happening um, and realized pretty quickly that it could have a big impact on, you know, the people around me at work originally, and then my family. And then as I've talked to more and more people, um, it's obviously a message that resonates with a lot of people who've, you know, the 93% of us who are suffering from chronic diseases here in the United States and around the world. So seed oils, I mean, it's, it's relatively new in, in our modern diet. Um, can you give us a bit of a background? How did seed oils become to such prominence and why are they put in pretty much every, all of our foods now? Well, you know, when I was in school taking an economics class, they presented the guns versus butter problem, right? Which was something that governments were running into at the end of the, um, 19th century, where you have production, you have limited resources, and you have resources that the state wants to use, guns, and resources that people want to use, butter. So seed oils was essentially the solution to that economic problem. It was used both for industrial purposes, and they figured out that you could sort of use it as a food source, right? And it was much cheaper than the animal fats that they'd been using before and fairly easy to produce because, you know, you can, at the time they were, the first seed oil that really came into heavy production in the United States, at least, was cottonseed oil, which had been largely a waste product. Um, so being able to repurpose that into first lamp oil and then food seemed like a great solution to what was otherwise an intractable problem. Um, you know, then the Germans, who were using sunflower oil, from my understanding, from uh, you know areas like the Ukraine, figured out how to hydrogenate the fats, which means convert them basically from a polyunsaturated fat into a saturated fat, and that made it an even more suitable replacement for animal fats because you could you know partially hydrogenate it, and the product would have the consistency of um, an animal fat, right? And that was in the United States that created uh, Procter & Gamble, who had been a soap company, created Crisco, and, you know, in Europe, uh, the Uni Margarine Company combined with the Lever Company, another soap company, and became Unilever, a big producer of uh, seed oil fats over there. So around about that time across the industrial world, you know, they started pumping these things into the food supply. And they you know, in their defense, they thought they were doing a good thing. And a lot of the research that we've since learned about the health problems of these fats didn't come around until much later. Yeah. Annabelle, do you have some questions you'd like to uh, start off with? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of diving more straight into it, but I already have some kind of an understanding of this and I've done research, but what happens to the body then when you consume seed oils, uh, especially what happens immediately and then what happens if it's prolonged? Okay, so that's acute toxicity and chronic toxicity, right? 
So yeah. are seed oils toxic? Well, the acute toxicity question is really kind of an interesting one. Um, there's a company here in the United States called Verta Health, uh, and their business is reversing diabetes through diet, right? And they make a big deal out of their um, low carb, it's a low carb keto approach. What they don't make as big a deal out of is that they also recommend that people avoid polyunsaturated fats. And the reason they do that is that Steve Finney, their chief medical officer, did a really interesting study back in the 90s with trying to figure out if um, pretty high-end athletes, cyclists in his case, could do well on a low-carb diet. And what he tried feeding them initially, what the dietitian, you know, so you've got this dietitian who's got to come up with this diet with no carbohydrates. And what they decided to use as the primary fat source, source was mayonnaise. Mayonnaise, you know, is mostly soybean oil in the United States, at least. Um, and it had the interesting effect of causing everybody on all of the subjects in the experiment to get sick, right? They all got nauseous and they couldn't continue with the diet. Um, so Finney went and experimented on himself and put a nasal tube up his nose and fed himself with different fats. <laughs> this is a dedicated scientist and doctor. Um, and what he discovered is that when he, you know, because he wanted to eliminate any taste, right, to see if the nausea effect would still happen. So he was on a diet at that point of mostly animal fats. He knew that was fine. He tried olive oil and he tried, I think it was soybean oil, up, you know, up this tube going up his nose and down into his stomach. And what he found was that the soybean oil made him sick. You know, same thing, nausea. He couldn't tolerate it, whereas the other fats were completely fine. Now, there's a whole range of studies in the literature, including a recent one looking at a ketogenic diet where they observed that, you know, people on a high polyunsaturated fat ketogenic diet produce more ketones, which is true, they, they do, and we can get into why that is. But they also all got sick from nausea and didn't want to continue on it, right? So there's good evidence, both from Finney's self-experimentation and from some other research going all the way back to the 1960s, that people on a high polyunsaturated fat diet get not get nauseous, right? Nauseous is a symptom often the first symptom of toxicity. Now, chronic toxicity, when you consume seed oils in excess, you it builds up in your body tissue. Um, you know, the fats in your diet pretty much drive the fats that your body is built out of. You know, you are, you are what you eat, more or less. Um, and then over time, the problem is, since these fats are so susceptible to oxidation, they start oxidizing in the various tissues that they are... Um, incorporated into. And the toxic, the products of polyunsaturated fat oxidation are largely toxic. And some of them are extremely toxic, right? They're, they're cytotoxic, they cause cell death, they're genotoxic, they cause, um, you know, serious DNA damage, they're mutagens, they can cause mutations that can potentially lead to diseases like cancer. Um, so, yeah. Does that get to the, does that answer your question? That does answer my question. The only thing is when you say it causes damage in the body, what would happen if somebody um, grew up for maybe the first 15, 20 years uh, of their life, such as myself, on a, a standard diet where they were being fed seed oils or food cooked in seed oils, and then they <laughs> discovered that it's not good for them? and then converted and started only using animal fats. Is it possible to reverse any of the damage or is it kind of once you've had it and been exposed to it, the damage is done? That depends, unfortunately, is the answer. I mean, obviously, you know, well, maybe not obviously. There's good evidence that seed oils are involved in cancer. Unfortunately, I've never seen any good evidence that stopping to eat seed oils will, you know, cure a cancer that they were involved in the causation of. Um, but as I said, you know, the fats in the diet control your body composition. So we've seen in animal studies that tissue composition will rapidly follow what dietary fats, um, you know, but a lot of it depends on the turnover of the cells in the body. So some cells like skin cells, 
um, turnover continuously, right? And when I fixed my diet, I started seeing benefits in my skin rapidly within weeks, right? And then there were other tissues like cartilage. Cartilage um, rapidly takes up polyunsaturated fats um, when an organism is young. What we don't have any evidence for is if you reverse that process, are you able to reverse the composition of the cartilage over time? A lot of people who fix their diets report that their arthritis gets better. Um, and so hopefully that's an indication that, you know, you can replace those fats, but, you know, tissues like cartilage in the heart, you know, your heart cells you have for life. So, you know, the composition of your heart cells can change the fats that are comprised of it change, but if you have damage to it, it is kind of an open question, whether you can undo that damage. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the research, when they talk about this, they talk about irreversible protein damage. I don't necessarily believe that because I've never seen a study where they're actually fixing the diet and then seeing what happens to the protein damage. So, you know, but in experience, people tend to have a lot of benefits and a lot of them start off real fast. Some of them take longer. For instance, in my case, it took four years for my liver enzymes to normalize. Um, you know, so it's, you know, yeah, I think you can make, I think, let me put it this way. I think it's certainly worth doing. <laughs> I wouldn't say just because we know that it's not going to be a perfect fix for everything, you shouldn't do it because I think the benefits have been pretty significant, certainly in my life. So, so Tucker, are you saying that sort of it's the polyunsaturated fat component that, that makes these fats more unhealthy or is it just the omega-6 component? Because you say that omega-6 is what oxidizes, right? I'm assuming well, like you can't lump sunflower oil in with like chicken, right? <laughs> so, I was going to ask. Yeah, so because I've heard a lot about, um, you know, from like the repeat community and everything in terms of not consuming things like chicken and pork due to the higher polyunsaturated fat content. But in my opinion, these are completely different compounds we're talking about, but I'm not the expert here. Tucker is. So. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it is pretty much the same problem. And so a polyunsat, just to back up, a polyunsaturated, you know, you have saturated fat, which has a string of carbon atoms and a full complement of hydrogen atoms comprising the fat chain, right? And fat chains come in different lengths. Um, you know, the typical like stearic acid, the main fat that's found in beef fat is an 18 carbon chain, right? With a complete complement of hydrogen atoms. A monounsaturated fat, like the all, like the fat in uh, olive oil, oleic acid is missing um, hydrogen and it has a double bond in that location, right? A polyunsaturated fat is a fat that has, you know, more than one missing hydrogen and therefore has multiple double bonds. Now these double bonds between the carbon atoms are susceptible to oxidation, to oxygen coming in and attaching itself and breaking the fat up, right? So that's what we mean by oxidation. And the more double bonds fat chain has, the more susceptible it is to oxidative damage, right? And that is, so then we have, you know, additionally, omega-3 and omega-6 fats, you know, everybody's heard those terms. What, what that means is basically how many carbons from the end of the atom, the omega end, uh, the, you know, omega means end, how many carbons from the end of the chain is the first double bond, right? So in omega-3s, it's three, in omega-6s, it's six, and then they can have other double bonds after that point, right? So any polyunsaturated fat is going to be highly susceptible to oxidative damage. Different types, omega-3 and omega-6, for instance, break down into different things, right? And the omega-6s are problematic because what they break down to are products that they break down to are much more toxic than what omega-3 fats break down into point A. Point B, or one and two. Um, second point is that um, when an omega-3 fat breaks down, becomes rancid, right? You can smell it. That's why fish smells bad when it's been sitting around. Omega-6 fats don't smell that bad to us, right? We don't have the same reaction to it. It kind of has 
what I call a flat smell. You know, I mean, if you have a box of crackers in your pantry and you notice they're a year past the due date, right? You smell them. It doesn't smell like a fish that's been sitting in there for two years. It smells a little flat, a little funny, but not, you know, disgusting. Um, so which is a big benefit, <laughs> which is why they use omega-6 fats, not omega-3 fats when they're making processed foods, because they want it to be able to sit on the shelf for a long time. And having a fat that people don't find objectionable when it goes rancid is a big benefit, right? So when you, so when you have an animal like a chicken or a pig or a person that has a single stomach, and we'll get into that later, as much fat as they consume is going to go into their body tissues, right? So whether they did a really interesting study, um, the people who demonstrated that omega-6 fats cause obesity, they did a really interesting study with salmon where they fed the salmon soybean oil and the salmon got fatty. And then they ground up the salmon and they fed the salmon to mice and the mice got sick and fatty, right? So it, the fats bioaccumulate up the food chain, right? So one of the signature effects of an omega-6 fat is that it lowers your LDL cholesterol, right? That's why they were originally prescribed by the doctors of the American Heart Association to the entire United States in 1961 is because they thought that LDL cholesterol caused heart disease. And since omega-6 fats lower, you know, since vegetable oils roll up pretty reliably lower LDL cholesterol, they figured this was a good thing, right? So other sources of omega-6 fats like nuts or pork, for instance, have the same effect, right? Because they contain the same fats and it has the same effect on the body. So yeah, unfortunately, you know, if you're eating chicken or pork that's been fed a lot of grain and a lot of seed oils, which they do to fatten them up, it's going to have the same effect on you as if you'd eaten seed oils directly. So what if you're eating um, chicken or pork that, yeah, because I know that the quality obviously makes a huge difference. So what if it's a uh, regeneratively farmed eating, I guess, what it's supposed to be eating and it hasn't been fed any grains or soy or corn? Does that make a difference in the structure of its tissue? And then would that have a different effect on us? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, it's entirely dependent. You know, just like us, it's entirely dependent on what they eat. I mean, you know, there was... Um, the Okinawans, we've all heard about the Okinawans, this quote unquote blue zone. Um, well, contrary to what the blue zone folks say, the Okinawans ate a lot of pork. And it's interesting to note that what they were feeding their pork was a lot of vegetables and also a lot of coconut, which has very low omega-6 levels. And there was one study done where the omega-6 fat level of pork from Okinawa was like 1%. Right. And that was because they had this diet where the input was very low. Therefore, they didn't concentrate it. And, you know, that may be part of why the Okinawans once upon a time had such long lifespans. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, that can depend that there's a wide range over what it what it can be in an animal, depending on how it's fed. And, and so um, how likely are these oils to oxidize, oxi, sorry, oxidization when they're exposed to heat? Like say, if you put them in a frying pan, does that make them that much more toxic? How does that, how does that process work? They're guaranteed. How likely is it? It is 100% chance, right? So these fats are so unstable that they oxidize during the process of creating the oil, they oxidize while they're sitting on the shelf, right? Time is enough to cause them to auto oxidize. And certainly once you heat them, you're, you know, hitting fast forward on the oxidation process. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's you're, I mean, even I learned recently, and I was quite surprised to learn this, that the level of oxidation in a freshly produced seed oil is 400 to a thousand times the level that you would find in a healthy body tissue, like an LDL particle, for instance. Wow. Right? So when you buy them, they're already rancid, right? Wow. And then by heating them, you are making them even more rancid and toxic. Is that across the board with like, say, olive oil and avocado oil and all the 
They're all of well, again, it all depends on the fats, right? So the monounsaturated fats are far more resistant to oxidation than the polyunsaturated fats. Something like an olive oil or a avocado oil has two issues. One is that they just naturally have a wide variation in how much omega-6 they can contain, right? Just because of how the plant develops, if it's on the sunny side versus the shady side of, you know, the orchard where it's grown. Um, and then once you produce those fats, because they're very valuable, there's a huge problem with cutting them with cheaper seed oils, right? Uh, UC Davis has done a couple of research projects and they found that most, you know, 80% of olive oils and 80% of avocado oils are fraudulently cut with seed oils just because it's more profitable to do it that way. Wow. I know so a lot of food, you, they'll say get, like, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say, if you can get good ones, then yeah, they're much better, but okay. You don't know what you're getting, unfortunately. Yeah, I just I've seen a lot of products. I always say like sunflower oil and or canola oil and or it's like I I, I never understood why they always you know they they well, don't just uniformly use just one oil. Why is it always like and or four other oils potentially? Yeah, because they want to maintain their flexibility to use whatever me, whatever's cheapest. cheapest, right? Exactly. Uh, okay. 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 Um, and one, one last question is, you know, pertain to that and I'll hand it back to you, Annabelle, but what about, um, have you done a lot of research in terms of like the other toxins in these oils? Like I know like sunflower, uh, commonly comes back as like, has that ha having the uh, highest aflatoxin content, um, which is highly carcinogenic. Um, and then there's also like hexane and, and the solvents and stuff that, that they use, uh, yeah. for, for soy. Um, is that is that another component to the toxicity of these oils? Well, aflatoxin is a toxin from mold. Um, I wasn't aware that it was in sunflower oil, but it's very commonly found in peanuts. And can I presume get into peanut oil depending on the production? Um, For minor saying sunflower actually has the highest level of aflatoxins generally tested. Oh, I didn't know that. Sunflower, <laughs> corn, sunflower, corn, and that's usually the the nuts like peanuts and stuff like that underneath that. Okay. Well, yeah, aflatoxin is a known carcinogen flat out end of story. So yes, avoid aflatoxin, yeah. avoid foods that contain aflatoxin. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody would take the other side of that argument. Um, yeah. Hexane, as far as I know, is a, hexane is a highly toxic. It's used as solvent to extract the oils from the seeds, right? Because uh there's no other way to get them out i mean there are some things like you know sesame seed you can squeeze the sesame seeds and the oil will come out that doesn't work with soybean oil or i think corn you have to use some sort of solvent hexane is highly volatile right so they can and what that means is that when you soak the seeds and you extract the oil that you can warm it up and the hexane leaves i've never heard any accounts of hexane remaining in the food product Okay. I mean, that's why they use it because it's so volatile and so easy to get back out. Hexane on its own is like, is somebody told me that it's illegal to have hexane shipped to a residential address in the United States. I don't know if that's true or not, but it gives you an idea of how nasty it is. Yeah. Well, I um, want to be fair. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, sort of promote fear, you know, or, or, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't want to, I don't want to be too dogmatic in my approach, right? I'm just right. Sort of curious as to if, whether that might be a problem. And most, most of these fats are pretty highly refined, you know, because they're trying to get it down to, so that, you know, except for stuff like olive oil, obviously, where the, you know, the phytochemicals in the oil is part of the selling point. Most of the rest of them, they're trying to get it as close to the fatty acids as possible. They don't want other stuff in it, like, you know, uh, canola oil is made from rapeseed. Rapeseed has this fatty acid called erucic acid, which may be toxic to humans. They try and get all of that out. And cottonseed oil, don't eat cottonseed oil. Cottonseed <laughs> oil has this super nasty thing in it called gossy Paul, which <sighs> literally can't make this stuff up. Now, mind you, we've been eating goss we've been eating cottonseed oil and therefore gossy Paul since the late 1800s. And the Chinese government discovered, I think in the 1990s, when they were pursuing their one-child policy, that 
Gossy Paul is fat in cottonseed oil is a very effective permanent, it's very effective at inducing permanent male sterility. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yeah. And they've this just from, uh, recently uh, come out, you know, a lot of the Gossy Paul is, re is removed in the refining process, um, but not all of it, unfortunately. So they're now trying to come up with GMO cottonseed oil to get rid of all the Gossy Paul. But yes, they've been feeding us toxic fats for well over 100 years. It was discovered that Gossy Paul is the toxic ingredient in cottonseed oil in 1915. Wow. Yes, thanks, folks. Well, it's a, Mr. Kellogg's goal was to make a sterile to uh, to begin with. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Annabelle, I'll, I'll uh, pass over the uh, floor to you now. Okay, so we've talked about olive oil, monounsaturated. We talked about polyunsaturated. So, what about coconut oil? Because I know that uh, it can cause issues with the thyroid using coconut oil to cook with, um, especially if you're using it for too long. And obviously, it's not an actual fat; it's still an oil. But what's your opinion on that? Well, uh, so the difference between a fat and an oil is basically what it looks like at room temperature, right? If it's solid, it's a fat. If it's liquid, it's an oil. Coconut is kind of annoying in that regard for a whole variety of reasons. One of them is that I think its melting point is like 78 degrees. So depending on where you are, it's a fat or an oil. If you're in the tropics, <laughs> it's an oil. If you're in a temperate area, it's a fat. Um, <laughs> cotton, uh, coconut oil is the worst oil to use if you were going to be reusing it for frying, right? Because oh. coconut oil has very short, shorter chains are more susceptible to breaking down into toxins. Any fat can break down into toxins if you heat it enough, right? I mean, that's just the nature of fats. Um, so yes, if you're going to fry with coconut oil, which I do, you only want to use it once and then toss it out. You don't want to deep fry in it and reuse it like restaurants do. So yeah, if you go to a restaurant and they say, you know, we're using coconut oil in, in the deep fryer, take a pass on the French fries from that place. <laughs> you want to see something like beef tallow that's very stable or even, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, even olive oil is very stable when you cook with it, even though it's mostly monounsaturated fats. Um, so yeah, coconut oil is, you know, a healthy fat. It's a little bit different from, you know, if you go look in the botany stuff is coconut seed, right? We make this distinction between seed oils like soybean oil and corn oil and rice bran oil and fruit oils like avocado and um, olive. Coconut, if you go read the if you go ask a botanist or read, you know, about this on Google, they argue back and forth about whether it's a seed or a fruit. So it's kind of the annoying seed oil because it's not an easy category, but it is, I would say, generally a healthy seed oil. And there are populations that have been eating a lot of, that eat a lot of coconut oil and they don't have like the Catavans who are famously free of heart disease and diabetes and obesity. And they, you know, their main fats come from coconut and from fish. So yeah, I would say it's definitely healthy. Just don't reuse it. I hadn't heard that bit about the thyroid, by the way, but. Yeah, if you, it's not ideal in the long term, it can impact the thyroid. I'm not quite sure exactly. Are what you the getting this from the repeat community? No, no, not okay. from the community. Um, but so aside from coconut oil, what else do you use to cook with? Mostly butter. Butter. Pa oh, pastured not butter. I prefer the taste of butter, honestly. I've used beef tallow. Okay. When I started this experiment, um, I had two young daughters and they didn't like beef tallow because it sticks to the top of your mouth. Um, mm -hmm. They much preferred butter. So, you know, trying to convince them to eat this way. I mean, beef tallow, we, I would use it to deep fry and, you know, uh, we would make empanadas, which is this Latin American treat in deep frying it in beef tallow and it was unbelievably good wow. you know um so yeah it has it has its place it's got a very distinctive beefy taste so it sort of depends on the dish that you're using whether or not you're going to use beef tallow in my opinion but for like eggs i use butter and for sauteing vegetables i generally use butter Can okay you... so sorry Closer. scott no go ahead go ahead Okay, so to minimize the toxic burden, because you said that all, all fats can 
produce toxins or break down into toxins if heated at a high enough temperature or if heated enough. What would be the most ideal thing to do? Because obviously a lot of people who watch this channel um, and who follow Scott are in the carnivore space. And so obviously using beef fat, using things like lard um, is very popular. People eat pork, chicken, fish, um, they use butter, all of these things. So what would you recommend? Because, uh, for example, I render down beef fat and then I use that to cook with. But I try and render it down on a low temperature and then I only use it once. I never reheat it. So what would be your recommendations for making, I guess, your cooking the, the safest in terms of the fat toxins? Well, beef tallow, you could definitely reuse. Uh, what, okay. I used, what I used to do is pour it through a paper towel to filter out whatever food particles in it. I mean, assuming you're deep frying, it doesn't really, it's not really practical to reuse it if you're just like sauteing with it. Um, good, beef fat is very stable. I mean, that's why McDonald's back in the good old days before the vegans got to them used to use beef tallow for their French fries. Um, you wanna cook at lower temperatures, right? You don't want to overheat things. If your fat starts smoking, that means you've heated it up too much. Um, mm -hmm. So be a little patient, <laughs> right? Keep the, keep the cooking temperatures down. And that's just as true for, I mean, I, and that said, I grill a lot of meat. So, you know, you got to decide what your poison is going to be, I guess. Um, but, you know, again, you try and not overcook things. You don't want to char things. You don't want, you know, your fats to be smoking. And um, I mean, <laughs> cooking, this is one of the more cooking oils a known carcinogen when you're using it for frying. So, you know, it's not like a hypothetical damage here. The leading cause of lung cancer in women is frying with cooking oils. So, you know, it's definitely not a hypothetical issue. Um, but yeah, so you want to keep it down. You want to use more stable fats. You want to avoid obviously the polyunsaturated fats and, um, you know, be a little patient when you're making your food. Mm. Um, you touch on coconut oil. So I just want to bring you back to that for just one second. Um, now, obviously in the keto space, which is kind of where we are, um, MCT oil gets used a lot. And obviously people don't fry with MCT oil, but they use it a lot of like their coffees or products to, to boost their ketones. Uh, do you have any thought on that? Well, yeah, I mean, and you know, MCT oil is just a, shorter chain fat, right? And the way your body works, um, you don't really store those directly. So they tend to go straight to the mitochondria and then are broken down into fuel. Um, the same is actually true of short chain omega-3 fats, like uh, the ones that are found in chia seeds, which are why people like chia seeds. Um, I mean, I've, you know, kind I practice intermittent, ketosis. I was on a ketogenic diet for about 10 years um, and was doing the whole butter and coffee thing <laughs> back before bulletproof coffee was a thing. Um, you know, you get, it's fine. Um, coconut oil is great. It definitely will do that. I just don't know how necessary it is to be continually in ketosis, especially you know, I think as an intervention, if you're fixing your metabolism, you know, if you're diabetic and you're trying to get over it, that's a great intervention. Uh, once you do that, then I don't think there's any particular problem with adding back carbohydrates to tolerance. I, you know, eat what they call safe starches like potatoes and rice and um, similar flours that don't come from grains. And I just find that if I eat too much of it, I feel crappy. So, you know, I kind of put a limit on it. Yeah. But so you don't see anything in terms of the toxicity of like MCT oil, just consuming that because it's such a popular. M MCT, I mean, MCT oil, I wouldn't say is toxic unless you're cook unless you heat it. Yeah. Okay. So I, yeah, I would definitely advise against deep frying. Frying deep frying. MCT oil. <laughs> I don't think too many people use it for that purpose, but yeah, exactly. I've never heard of it, but you know, I mean, and that's another one, you know, MCT is well known for, you know, I mean, I think some of the bottles of it even come with a warning label. Don't consume too much because it's going to make your intestinal tract extremely unhappy. <laughs> so, and you know, when you get it in coconut oil and you know, coconut oil, from what I've read, 
pretty much has the same effect as refined MCT oils. So I would recommend that people stick with that and it's cheaper, right? Because it's the chain length, your body, there's, you know, the other factor other than the saturation of a fat is the chain length of the fat. Your body processes longer chain fats differently from shorter chain fats. And the shortest chain fats are the ones that go straight into your mitochondria, your body, can store them, but that's not the first option as opposed to longer chain saturated fats. You know, your body's being very smart about this, right? It's essentially prioritizing storing the most stable fats and then using the less stable fats for more immediate needs like fuel and ox, you know, like fuel. Polyunsaturated fats are preferentially oxidized when you consume them, right? And given that the body's a survival machine, it's, you know, sort of like alcohol, right? Alcohol is a poison. You can't store it. So your body burns it off as fast as it can. Well, if you see a similar thing with glucose and with these polyunsaturated fats and short chain fats that your body can't store very effectively. Okay. Annabelle? Yeah. Why are you so popular with the vegans? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the vegans... First off, it's effective, you know, it's a religious mindset, right? And I mean, look, I've known a couple of vegans who base their diet off monounsaturated fats. Um, Scott Jurek, the ultra runner, wrote a book called Eat and Run that's really great, in which he describes his training history and also gives a lot of recipes. And I always recommend that to people. You know, if you want to be a vegan, this is the way to do it because you're avoiding, you know, the harmful fats. Um, there's a surgeon, um, Carrie Deulis, who also is a vegan. She's a lot of health issues, you know, but that don't have anything to do with being a vegan. She's celiac and, you know, and she just, she feels best on a vegan diet. I don't per se have a problem with veganism. I just think that they a lot of them get too much into it as a religious thing. Um, I mean, the background of veganism, whether you start from the Eastern tradition or the Western tradition is, you know, an offshoot of either Hinduism or Christianity. Um, and, you know, I just, I'm religious myself, but I'm not, I'm scientific enough to go say, okay, there are issues with this. I mean, I shared an office mm -hmm. I've mentioned in some other podcasts with a Jane who are the oldest vegetarian community on earth. And I learned more about the problems of a vegetarian diet from him than from anybody, any scientist or nutrition scientist that I've ever talked to because his family had been pursuing a vegetarian diet for 5,000 years. And they knew what the problems were. And one of the problem was if you're a vegan, you get sick right? Because for most of those 5,000 years, they couldn't go to the health food store and buy a bottle of B12 supplements, right? They had to consume dairy to get that, to get those nutrients. Mm -hmm. So they did. Um, you know, and I mean, my simplest test, whenever somebody gives me some sort of vegan diet book is to flip to the index and look up B12 and see how they handle it. Some of them don't even mention it. Some of them, like Dr. Grieger, make up this ridiculous story that traditionally we would get B12 from the dirty water that we would drink, which is just absurd, right? And then there are some honest ones who, you know, I mean, there you can make a very scientific, if you believe in veganism as an ethical choice, I don't share that belief, but you can make a pretty good argument and construct a healthy vegan diet, right? But it requires industrially produced supplements. There's no way to do it otherwise. I find, you know, I, I could go on a, on a bit of a rant about this, but, you know, I think the, the problem is I, I have with the whole vegan movement is that there's a lot of corporate interest backing that up. And the, the problem is, is that when you have that, there's also going to be the preponderance of evidence and quantity of evidence backing that up as well, correct? So um, I think that there's a real sort of war between what is uh, appropriate in terms of our evolution and ancestry and what the science is, you know, I think yeah. that Christian science 
as well, Barclay they would say is, is nutrition science a real science because there's so many confounders in there and there's so many variables in there that could affect that. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, first off, modern nutrition science was largely an offshoot of the seventh day Adventists who started, you know, is a religion. <laughs> <laughs> they started as a millennialist religion. I forget what it was called originally. Uh, the Wikipedia article talks about this. And they believed that, you know, the uh, ascension was coming in the middle of the 1800s and then it didn't happen. And they were like, okay, well, now what do we do? And this woman came along and claimed she had these visions that, you know, meat is dirty and you should eat a vegetarian diet. And, you know, that's, John Kellogg, who, uh, whose brother turned around and followed, um, founded the Kellogg's company, Kellogg's cereals were an offshoot of the Adventists also. That's also where all of these plant-based meats started, right? Um, and one of the things that they went and did is founded the profession of dietitian, which was largely, they view this as a form of missionary work, spreading Ellen White's view of what a healthy human diet is um, around the world. And they're very good at it, right? I mean, I think I've, from what I've read, the Adventist church is the second largest operator of hospitals on earth after the Catholic church. And they are, you know, the nutrition science and dietet dietitian fields are full of Adventists and they won't tell you that they're doing what they're doing for that reason. I mean, the current chairman of the dietary guidelines, the U.S. Dietary Guideline Advisory Panel is an open Adventist dietary missionary called uh, John Sabate. Um, so it's not like this is a hypothetical thing or a conspiracy theory. He wrote a paper in a journal titled Religion talking about how successful the Adventist church has been in propagating their dietary views through food systems all around the world, right? I mean, the dietary guidelines are largely informed by the Adventist religion. And as far as the alleged corporatist influence goes, I'm all in favor of it. And I will, you know, point specifically to the creation of the dietary guidelines, which was originally supposed to be largely vegetarian and the meat producing industries pushed back against it and had them walk it back so that it was not so anti-meat as it would have been originally. Um, so that said, there are people, um, I mean, I mentioned Verta Health, you know, one of the founders of that company is a registered dietitian, Jeff Volick. I recently interviewed a guy, Tom Brenna, Oddly enough, both Volick and Brenna came from the University of Connecticut. So, you know, there may be some schools of nutrition science that are better than others who, you know, Brenna has, takes a very scientific objective look at things. He's very anti-seed oils as a result. <laughs> um, you know, so you've really got to look into, and then there are some people you encounter I mean, I've encountered people online who were registered dietitians and had absolutely no idea that their profession was an offshoot of a cult, right? So, you know, the, up until recently, I forget the name of the woman who, who founded it, um, but up until recently, the dietitian profession had a dinner every year in her name, celebrating her impact on the profession. And when people like me started pointing out the bias inherent in that, um, they changed the name of their dinner, right? So it's no longer, uh, it's no longer in memoriam of the founder of their profession. They just say it's, oh, for the best. It's uh, Lena Cooper is the woman's name. So you know, the Academy of Dietitians would have the Lena Cooper dinner every year and they would, you know, celebrate how this cultist who was an acolyte of and worked with John Kellogg founded this profession, right? But nobody's ever, they're not honest about this. I mean, it would be, you know, and if they were honest about us, would doctors, you know, why should a doctor recommend a dietitian, right? It's not 
based on science for a large part it's based on this you know it's based on a religion and this religion's viewpoints and it's why when you you know there was a fellow who was interviewed recently and he talked about he he was on the who panel that came out and said that you know oh meat's bad for you it's carcinogenic it's carcinogenic and he talked about how they ignored most of the evidence and he thought at least 30 percent of the people on the panel were practicing vegetarians and vegans and it totally biased the results right and i mean i've gone through and looked at the who determination that uh high temperature frying with vegetable oils is a probable human carcinogen and they ignore most of the evidence right even <laughs> quite clear-cut examples of how linoleic acid turns into this um chemical TTDDE that is a human genetic mutagen, right? It causes, you know, it causes the genetic damage that often leads to cancer. And they just ignore a lot of this stuff. And why are they ignoring it? Well, they've got a bias. They've got a built-in bias. And then, you know, corporations turn around, you know, there's a great paper that I found, um, that came out in 2010 and it was an account of this meeting between food scientists working for corporations and the dietitians, and they were talking about how much pressure the corporations get from dietitians and from the government to reformulate their foods to accord with the dietary guidelines mm -hmm. right and in the united states at least the dietary guidelines by law have to be followed by schools hospitals the military and probably other things right so they literally have control and then the food companies you know you can't say that your food is healthy unless it's in accord with the dietary guidelines so every time you go you know if you go to the, i mean this was a bit of a scandal a few years back you know if you go to the supermarket and you see that fruit loops are a healthy food it's because they are in accord with the dietary guidelines and the criteria for that are low saturated fat low added sugar and low added sodium. Um, and none of the three of those have a good evidence base, but nevertheless, every food company out there, they want to sell their products and, you know, they're not going to be able to do it effectively unless they are in accord with, you know, the teachings of this cult. And anyway, this paper went through them trying to push back against these dietitians on this panel and how little you know, effect they were able to have, even when they're pointing out, look, we can't eat this food because our DNA doesn't support us being able to find it nutritious. And the dietitians are like, well, make it anyway. Great. Thanks, guys. And I mean, it's come out, you know, that the little Fruit Loops being a healthy food story came out as a result of, you know, industry working with the Tufts School of Nutrition to come up with a food guideline and Tufts has just again come up with this thing called the food compass, which was supposed to be, you know, basically this algorithmic way to rate foods based on how well they comply with the dietary guidelines. And it came up with things like Fritos being considered far healthier than beef or eggs, right? It's ridiculous. But if you look, you know, I mean, that's why you know, you look at the history of this stuff. Yes, if you try and follow um, the precepts of the Adventist church or the dietary guidelines that they helped and create, you inevitably wind up consuming junk food, right? Because you're avoiding the natural foods that are high in healthy saturated fats. And you're left with stuff like Fritos and Fruit Loops being touted as healthy foods. Speaking of which, by the way, um, I know we've spoken a lot about the problems caused by consuming polyunsaturated fats and vegetable and seed oils, but what kind of problems do we face if we don't eat saturated fat and if we don't actually eat the fat that we're supposed to be eating? So tallow, butter, any kind of animal fat, what would happen to us long term? Do you know? Well, yeah, we know. Um, I mean, this the fellow I mentioned before, Tom Brenner, did a really interesting study recently where he was there's this um uh sorry i want to yeah. show this after story i showed that by accident but no, wor <laughs> no worries um so 
you know, there are a lot of starving people in Africa and they have this concoction that they feed them to try and bring them back to health. And he was able to show that if you include omega-3 fats in it, their neurological development is quite a lot better, right? There are other RCTs in starving children. And omega-3 fats, you don't need to get from fish. You can get them from pastured animals, right? Um, like, you know, pastured beef or whatever will have... I mean, that's how we would get it traditionally if you were living in, you know, the middle of Europe. <laughs> you probably weren't getting much in the way of fish or if you were living in the middle of Africa um, and you would get it from ruminants who, you know, would be low in omega-6 and have a reasonable amount of omega-3, probably the, the amount that you want, right? They don't have much of either, but they have enough. Um, mm -hmm. there are other, you know, studies looking at RCTs in human children coming out of starving children in Africa where, you know, they're starving because they're on a plant-based high carb diet, right? So how do you fix that? You add, they tried adding milk and adding meat and, you know, the kids who got some milk did better. The kids who did best got, did best. So yeah, it causes issues in neurological development, development of the eyes. The eyes are highly dependent on omega-3 fats. And, you know, the only source of long chain omega-3 fats, which are the most effective way to get them are animal products, period, end of story. So with, I know that we've already spoken about this, but I didn't actually ask you earlier. This is just a very quick question. So would pasture raised animals, all of them, including things like uh, chicken raised properly and pork and ducks, any kind of animal raised properly on pasture, would they all have omega-3 or is it just ruminants? No, they're all going to have some omega-3. They're all going to have it. Okay. And dairy, is that high in omega-3 as well, if it's properly done? Again, pastured dairy is going to have Pasture. more, because even ruminants, because of how they digest, right? They run food through bacteria, and then they're effectively eating the bacteria. The bacteria are very good at converting linoleic acid into other things, because in part, linoleic acid is toxic to a lot of bacteria. So they wind up you know, if you look at the effects of grain feeding on cows, for instance, A, if you feed them too much, it kills them. <laughs> so even when they're fattening it up, they don't feed them too much. But also, excuse me, the difference in the fatty acids between a pastured, you know, grass fed cow and a grain finished cow is not all that big. They do have a little more omega-6 and a little less omega-3, but the total amounts are not all that huge. So, you know, if people can't afford grass-fed meat then i just say look eat eat the grain finished stuff and just make sure you eat some fish once in a while so you get sufficient omega-3s i recommend against fish oil consumption for because of the variety of oxidization reasons. of it or? the oxidization of it and also the most effective way you know and this was something i talked with tom brenna about when i interviewed him on my podcast the most effective way to get omega-3 fats from your food into your brain and your eyes is as a phospholipid, right? And not a triglyceride. It's more readily conveyed into the brain. Um, fish oil, they, it's just the triglycerides. So, you know, if you eat fish, you're getting it in the natural form that your body um, conveys into the tissues that need it more effectively. Okay. Um, I just want to bring up, so I was sharing the screen there for a second. So um, a lot of a lot of uh, debates I've seen, you know, um, coming from <clears throat> maybe more so the vegan side. Um, they have one smoking gun study that they always bring up. And I saw that in your debate with Matthew Nagra that he brought this study up as well. It okay. always seems to be their go to study. But there's one thing that people always seem to fail. So I looked at the study myself. Um, and there was actually a, a, a review of this study showing how, how crap it was, but okay, uh, this isn't even a study. It's just a consensus. It's ridiculous. But well, uh, okay. I mean, First, from the European Athler Atherosclerosis Society, but yes. before you continue, uh, Tucker, I just want to show my point here. Um, if anyone had, a, had, a, had any um, interest in looking at the conflicts of interest of these studies. Oh, those, yeah. This is probably the most ridiculous. Uh, sorry, I should have just gone at the beginning there. Oh, you starting of the study is yeah, I've yeah, never yeah, seen yeah. so many conflicts of interest coming from companies. I mean, look at it, it just goes a mile long. 
yeah, it's every yeah. pharmaceutical company known to man that promotes these statins and you know a lot of these companies like Bayer owns Monsanto and I mean it's just it's absolutely ridiculous so <laughs> I just wanted to point that out so this is a study that I actually love and the reason I love it is that they wrote another one they wrote a follow-up in 2020 that looks at the mechanisms behind this right and that's my favorite study. And that is one that I, Matt, Matt and I both cited in that debate. Matt didn't read it closely enough to realize what he was doing, but they list the steps of atherosclerosis. And the first step is the oxidation of the LDL particle, which is required for atherosclerosis to progress. And they link to a 1979 paper that's one of my favorites written by, uh, Joseph Steinberg and um, Whitstam, I can't remember his first name. Um, and they were the fellows who figured out, you know, what happens to LDL to make it atherogenic. And what they discovered was that the fats in the LDL get oxidized and that changes how your body processes it. Those oxidation, you know, those fats are toxic to the body. Oxidized LDL is cytotoxic. And what are the fats that are getting oxidized? Well, it's the omega-6 fats, <laughs> right? And then they did a couple of studies and wrote in rabbits and in humans where they showed that altering the dietary fats, removing the seed oils, altered how likely the LDL are to get oxidized and then commence the steps of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So yes, anybody who reads that closely and under and goes and reads the references, that's the best piece of evidence I have for the involvement of um, seed oils and cardiovascular disease. It's literally the consensus of what causes it. Well, I know that you uh, just have to uh, go in a second, but uh, did you have any last questions for Tucker before we uh, wrap things up? No, no final questions. Um, unless Tucker, I guess we'll get to it. But what, whatever your final words are, if you have any final words, or if Scott, if you have another question. No, uh, yeah, Tucker, if you could let us know. Uh, yeah, well, if you have I, any final final things to touch on, and uh, also where can we find you, and what do you have going on in your life? Okay, well, we I think we live in we live in a world where everybody is getting sick. 93% of the United States is metabolic, is considered to be metabolically unhealthy. This is a new situation in human history, right? And the best explanation we have for it at the moment is this consumption of omega-6, this excess consumption of omega-6 polyunsaturated fats via seed oils. And I think the Fixing your health by getting them out of your diet is the single most effective thing that you can do to improve your health from a from the obesity perspective, from the diabetes perspective, the cardiovascular disease perspective. And it's, you know, I, I really have to, I, I have to say it has to be seen to believed, to be believed. I mean, I converted people in my office when I fixed my diet based on what they saw happen to me over a couple of months. Um you know, and if, if you doubt it, try it. It's pretty easy. It's a little inconvenient, um, but the health benefits can just be astonishing. And there's an enormous amount of research to back it up. So, you know, it's well in line with uh, a scientific approach to nutrition. Um, I've got a blog yelling dash stop dot blogspot dot com. Um, I've got a YouTube channel to search for Tucker Goodrich and I'm very active on Twitter. Um, again, my handle is Tucker Goodrich and I've been working with a company called zero acre farms to help get this information out through their website. So if you search for them and look for their blog, uh, a lot of the research that I've been working on over the last year and change is going through that avenue. So, you know, it's it's out there. There's a lot of research out there. There's a lot of reading you can do if you want to. And um, I think anybody who looks at it objectively will be convinced. <laughs>